Hi, everyone. Welcome back to A Pastor's Thoughts. My name is Chris Harris, and we have another video to look at today. Uh, we do have something coming up in the very near future, though. We'll have a bit of a collab, if you will. We'll have a informal discussion between myself and uh, the guys over at the Provisionist Perspective, uh, Drew and Eric. Uh, hopefully, you'll um, stick around to see that. I don't have a firm date on when that will be. There are a few things that have to be have to be put in place before that happens, but uh, I look forward to the conversation. The conversation is going to be on uh, basically on Ephesians uh, chapter one, speaking about uh, uh, God choosing us, God choosing us before the foundation of the world. That uh, disputed passage that is Ephesians one four. So anyway, I may have someone on with me as well. We'll just have to see if that works out. Hopefully it does, uh, but hope to see you there for that. Now, again, today we're back on Layton again. He's um, just a, a good source for someone like me at this at this point. Well, who am I kidding? He's always been a good source for uh, things to do with Calvinism. Not necessarily the best source for what Calvinism is per se, but the video today that we're looking at is actually entitled, let me look, uh, make sure I get this right here. Uh, it's entitled Calvinist, uh, Calvinists Who Don't Know Calvinism. It's ought to be right up my alley, right? A lot of the things that I've said, uh, Leighton would say that I don't understand. I don't know what I'm talking about, which is the strangest thing for someone like me. As long as I've been a Calvinist uh, and as far into ministry as I am, so we're going to check out this video. And uh, just for a um, a future note here, I guess I do have some some like some new equipment coming in. So I, I still think this camera is a little too high. I'm like looking up at you there and you'll notice when i look at my screen i have to look down so much so it looks kind of funny on the on the screen there i have all that being rectified here this week so going forward hopefully the production will be a little better i'm, I'm uh, a lot of this thing i'm like flying by the seat of my pants here kind of trying to put this together this whole podcast thing has come about so that i can have an arena that i can do a type of blog type deal. I wanted to do some writing. This is a little simpler than writing, being able to video record these things. And it gives me the opportunity to, to, to react. Now I'd love to have interactions. And of course, uh, Leighton Flowers is always in, invited to have a conversation with me. Um, I would have one with him. That's, that's not a problem. Uh, I don't just interact with these videos because that's like the only thing I can, I can do if he, uh, if he would like to talk about some of these things, um, you know, kind of face to face is, much as that goes over the internet, I would definitely be willing to do that, as Drew and Eric and I are going to do here uh, pretty soon. So anyway, before we, before I keep rambling on here about stuff, let's pull the video up here of Leighton, and let's see what he has to say about what Calvinism is, and and uh, see if he can teach me a few things. Um, that would be appreciated. Okay, here we go. So like I said, this is Leighton. It's kind of a short video, but I am going to speed it up a little bit. Again, 1.25 is where I'll put it. It's a uh, it's a good bit to li uh, good bit to listen to. It's not real long. It's 12 minutes long. So we'll see how long this takes me. And again, I need to situate it here where I can. Get everything done. I'll probably cut a lot of this out in the editing. Yeah, probably be good. So, all right, we have his video pulled up here. We're going to, or I'm going to play that video now at 1.25, and I'm going to stop and give some commentary uh, as he goes along. If you just don't talk about the sovereign decree of God to condition everyone to be haters from birth, yeah, it sounds like he's just passively leaving them to do their own will and their own desire, but that's not true Calvinism. It's not according to the confessions. It's not what they're saying with regard to the divine sovereign decree. Not if they hold to the T of Tulip. Oh, we will talk about the confession a little bit here very shortly. There's always people in the side chat. There's people watching that say, oh, you're misrepresenting Calvinism because they don't know what Calvinism is. Uh, to be, let's just be honest. There's a lot of self -proc I do want to agree with Leighton here. Um, right. I'm not just critiquing him because he doesn't say, but I'm, I'm not just critiquing him to be critiquing him, right? He is right. There are a lot of people, especially in the side chat and in the comments of some of his videos that 
they don't, they don't understand Calvinism and they are Calvinists, but I mean, I, I was that way when I was young in my Calvinism, if you would say, uh, some, some of those, uh, folks are in, uh, the cage stage. So yeah, not that you have to cut them a ton of slack, but you got to understand where they are. And Leighton is a hundred percent right. There are people that claim to be Calvinists on the internet that really don't know what they're talking about as far as when, when they go to articulate Calvinism. So just so I, uh, I wanted to mention that. Claim Calvinists who have no clue as to what Calvinism, qua Calvinism, uh, properly defined by its leading scholars over the centuries, actually is. And, and I, I'm starting to think maybe Reformed Wiki somewhat fits into that category because of the way um, he, he has defined these terms. Uh, I didn't mean to jump jump ahead on that one. but And I'll just tell you right now, I don't, I don't know who Reformed Wiki is. I don't know what he's talking about here. Right? I'll just interact with what he's saying about this. I'm not here to... Um, point you to, to, to those types of sources or anything. I want to go back and look at that chart. Um, so total depravity, he doesn't have right. He, he, he doesn't make a distinction of what the real T actually stands for. All he thinks that the T stands for is that people are born under the sinful condition of Adam and Eve. And again, that is not uniquely Calvinistic. We can all affirm we, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We're all under the curse of sin. We all admit that. Okay. The, the, the unique aspect of Calvinism says because of that condition, even when the gospel is preached to you, even when the gospel is proclaimed to you clearly and the appeal of God is made to you, you will always hate it. You will always reject it because of the very condition you were decreed to have by God from birth. That is what Calvinism teaches. Uh, we're going to get into what the decree is here shortly, but I just want to like, just for a second, talk about what the, the claim he's making here, that, that the T of Calvinism is somehow unique to Calvinism in that what we mean is that the totally depraved person uh, will always reject God's call uh, to be reconciled, right? Will always reject the gospel when it's given to him. That's not uniquely Calvinistic. Like that, that's basic Christianity, like across the board, except for the provisionists. I, it, it's, you know, this is basic, basic Christianity. Uh, Armenians, who you definitely don't want to say are Calvinists, uh, they are Reformed, though, right? They come out of the Reformed tradition. Jacob, uh, Jake, ja Jacobus, or Jacob Arminius, uh, was actually a student of Beza, who was the, the protege of, of John Calvin. Uh, so Jacob Arminius was very Reformed. They hold to the same understanding of the implications of the fall as Calvinists do. Right. And that would be that without in a without a unilateral work of God within the person, right? Without God either, as the Calvinists would say, regenerating the person, or as the Arminians would say, granting him prevenient grace, right? Without one of those things happening, then that person will always reject spiritual truth when it's given to him. Right, or her speaking generally of mankind, that that's just the case of uh, basic Christianity. I mean, that, that that's Calvinists and classical Arminians alike agree on the T. Right, we 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 differ in how we answer that problem. Like, how do people um receive the gospel? Right, to come to Christ in faith. But we agree that there's a problem there, that people on their own, without some inner working of God, that they can't they can't do it. They're always going to reject it, right? I just wanted to put that out there. This is not uniquely Calvinistic. Right. Okay. You have to understand that because a lot of people think, well, I'm a two or a three-point Calvinist. But they don't understand what the point means. If you redefine the point, then you're not a you're not affirming a point of Calvinism. So stop saying I'm a one or a two point Calvinist. No, if you, if you believe that you actually have the responsibility, the ability to respond to the gospel, then you're not a Calvinist at all. Okay. Hey, we too think that everyone has the ability to respond to the gospel. We would just say that the person, the unregenerate person would always respond negatively, right? They make a choice. This is something that, that he, that he glosses over quite often, right? Because we say we can't make a positive choice for it if we are unregenerate, right? The, the person who is still in their sins, who, who hasn't received this inner working of God, just because they are never going to respond positively doesn't mean that they never respond to the gospel, right? They just always respond negatively. Like they actually look at the, the data that is presented in the gospel and they're like, ah, eh, nah, 
not for me. And they do that every single time unless they've been regenerated. Or in the Armenian's case, unless they've been given prevenient grace and then they can still reject it, right? But they are able to positively accept it at that point. Again, still, they're positing the same type of, of um, inability when it comes to the totally depraved or the unre unregenerate or those who are without prevenient grace. And within the Armenian tradition, there there is there is a debate as to exactly when prevenient grace comes to be. So I'm not saying they're monolithic on that, but they are they are in unison with the Calvinists saying what original sin uh, entails when it comes to the human condition post fall. Because the foundational point of Calvinism is that you are born unable to willingly to desire to accept the gospel, even when it's made clear to you. If, if you don't affirm that, you're not a Calvinist. You're not an Arminian either. Same thing, right? They, they affirm that exact same thing apart from, from an inner work of God, right? I don't know why that's hard to understand. And, and that, that's why you have to actually give distinctness for what Calvinists actually say. And so I feel like I have to educate Calvinists on what Calvinism is in order for them to know whether they should reject it or not. Because some of them have, have they've so watered down Calvinism and still call it Calvinism that it's not recognizable. It, it's not a distinctive of Calvin or Calvinism at all. Um, and again, that's why I'm pushing back on it. Look at, look at his definition of the you, unconditional election. God saves those he wishes. And then he calls it the concept of predestination. Do, do, okay. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm, I, I look. Yeah, it's simplistic. I agree. But I mean, I think it, I think it's okay. Love you, brother. But everybody believes God saves whoever he wishes. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, you make that claim, sure, but just don't know if that's the case, right? If, if, um, answer me this, Leighton. If Joe was one of these people that God wants to save, right? That he wishes Joe to be saved, and Joe libertarianly refuses to come to Christ in faith, then does, then does God save Joe? Or he wished Joe to be saved. I think you you would posit that God desires all men everywhere to be saved. I would, right? There's a, there's a prescriptive desire given for that. But if Joe libertarianly refuses to be saved, then God can't save him. All right, let's continue. That's not a distinctive of Calvinism. God can save whoever he wants to save. Who does he want to save? These are the ones I look on with favor. Those with a humble and contrite heart. <laughs> God saves whoever he wishes. Who does he wish to save? Those who trust in him. God doesn't wish to save everyone, Leighton? You just happen to believe that God is the one who causes certain people to trust in him while decreeing everyone else to be born unable to trust in him. That's the difference between our two views. The difference between our two views is not the fact whether God saves who he wishes. Of course God saves whoever he wishes. The question is, do you have any responsibility in that? And we believe that you do. Um, and, 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 Therefore, you're held blameworthy for your lack of faith or your lack of willingness to trust in him because you could actually have done otherwise. So again, this is not a distinctive of Calvinism. And so it's a really bad definition. We believe in predestination, by the way. He mentions the concept of predestination. We believe in predestination. But what do we believe about predestination different than the Calvinist? Well, the Calvinist believes that certain people unilaterally or arbitrarily picked before the foundation of the world are caused to believe so as to be saved. Uh, Leighton likes using this word cause and, and there is a cause involved, right? But I, I don't think he, I don't think he's using it properly. And we'll get into that in a minute. We, we would say, no, God has predestined that whoever believes will be saved. God has predestined for those who are in Christ Jesus through faith to be made holy and blameless and to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's the two times Paul uses the word predestination is in uh, Romans eight. And again, in Ephesians one, and both of them are about God predestining the faithful in Christ those who are called, who love him and are called according to his purpose, according to Romans 8, those are the ones he has predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. He has predestined them to be, quote unquote, holy and blameless. That's sanctification. That's that's being made into the image of Christ. And God has destined beforehand that whoever is in Christ will be made holy and blameless and to look like Christ. Just like I could say, uh, uh, you know, the storm is coming. Whoever gets under the shelter will be saved. They are destined to be saved. Whoever remains outside the shelter is destined, will be lost, or will be destroyed by the storm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is this is their argument from Ephesians 1-4, which I, I'm, I've done a lot on already. I'll have the conversation with Drew and Eric coming up. 
yeah, it just doesn't align with the text at all. Again, Leighton, the text does not say that God chose the way in which people would be saved. It says God chose people right, before the foundation of the world. God chose us is what it says, right? And the us is the faithful. I'll even agree with you. I mean, I mean, you have to agree with you that the us there is the faithful at Ephesus and Paul. Right, but the problem is, again, I'll point it out one more time, is that the pronoun itself, us, can be replaced with a name. Right? We know that Paul included himself. So it could be read, it could be read this way that God chose Paul before the foundation of the world. Pretty simple. Right? Or any other, any other of the saints that were in Ephesus at the time. Again, people Paul would have known personally. Right. This isn't just some general grouping of people. Right. Paul is writing a letter to people he would have personally known. Each one of them could have replaced the pronoun with their own name in verse four to read that God chose them before the foundation of the world. Right. People, not not what they would be, not not the the the, the storm shelter. Right. That you can get in, that you can that you can libertarianly choose to place yourself in. Right. God chose people. But anyway, let's continue. Hey, just like with the, the, the blood on the doorpost, whoever doesn't have the blood on the doorpost, their firstborn will be cursed. The curse, the death angel will come. If you do have the blood, he will pass over. It is destined beforehand. And therefore, anyone who perishes who's outside of the shelter, you could rightly say they were predestined to perish. Now, the reason they were predestined to perish is because God predestined beforehand that whosoever doesn't trust in him or come under his shelter will surely perish. And you could also say, Everyone inside that shelter was predestined to be saved. Why? Because God predestined beforehand these blessings, the salvation of the whoever is under his shelter. It has says nothing about him predetermining whether you get under his shelter or not. And this is where Calvinists have just mistaken what predestination, biblical predestination, really is all about. It's God destining beforehand what will happen to those who are in Christ. That's, that's the easiest way to understand it. Now, limited atonement. Look at what he says about limited atonement. This is the one that he actually, I think, gets remotely correct, if that makes sense. Christ died for the chosen only, not for everyone. That's the only one that's probably a very a, a, a pretty accurate description of one of the point. Yeah, it's accurate, but I, I don't even think Leighton understands what limited atonement is either, right? Because when we say Jesus died for the elect only or the chosen only, as far as particular redemption or um, uh, limited atonement is concerned, we don't mean that the work of the cross was insufficient for the whole world or every sinner, right? No, the work of the cross was sufficient for an infinite amount of sin. Right? It's not as though that the work itself is lacking, that Christ only paid a certain amount. That denies uh, what the whole idea behind penal substitutionary atonement. I know if Warren hears that he's, this, he's going to have a fit, but uh, that's the biblical model of the atonement. So the reason why we say Jesus died for uh, the elect only is because of what the preposition for points to, right? It points to the purpose or intent of God. And the purpose or intent of God can only be, um, can only point to the elect. Therefore, when we say Jesus died for the elect, right? Those chosen, uh, we mean that God intended to save them. That doesn't mean, and I know they've made the argument before, before, like we can't offer the gospel to, to the entire world because there's no atonement for them, right? Because Jesus didn't die for them. Ah, not the case at all. The limitation comes in the intent from God. It doesn't come in the work itself, right? It, hypothetically, if any like non-elect person were to come in faith, he'd be saved. Right, the, the atonement work is 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 done. There, there's nothing else that needs to be done, right? If 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 Christ needed to pay just for one sin of one person in the entire world, he would have had to do exactly what he did: stand in their place and receive that judgment on them. That's what uh, substitutionary atonement is. So, uh, well, to, to stand before the judgment, and receive the punishment for sin, right? In, in the singular sense, that 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 pays the penalty for sin, which is death, right? It, it doesn't matter how many sins were involved. Uh, and that is realized through one's being joined to Christ by faith. All right, let me continue. In this whole list here, this is the only one he actually gets 
an actual distinctive of Calvinism, right? Okay. The rest of them, in my estimation, you be the judge. He just doesn't, he just doesn't get it. He just doesn't get any of them right because he doesn't give any true distinctive of Calvinism. For example, look at what he says about irresistible grace. God's grace is given freely, as if we don't agree with that. Of course, God's great grace is given freely. He's not forced to give grace to anybody. Okay. It cannot be earned or denied. Again, we agree with that because we don't believe faith earns salvation. Okay. Which is exactly what we're going to get into later when he critiques Mike. We don't believe faith merits anything. Okay. God graciously chooses to give salvation, to bless those who believe and trust in him. But faith itself is a filthy rag apart from the atoning work of Christ. Um, and so we'll, we'll get into that. But notice what he says here is not distinctly or uniquely Calvinistic. All Christians could affirm that definition. Therefore, it's not a good definition. Uh, perseverance of the saints. Look what he writes here. Those elected by God have full power to interpret the will of God. I, 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 again, Again, we, we would agree with that because obviously we would say someone's elected who's in Christ and those who are in Christ would have the ability to interpret the will of God or to interpret the scriptures to understand the will of God. So we would agree with that statement too, as it's stated. Yeah, yeah, I admit that's a little weird on the perseverance of the saints. Uh, I didn't commentate much on irresistible grace, but I mean, irresistible grace is just grounded in the fact that it's a grace given by God. It's something that will have the effect that's intended, right? Um those elected by God have full power to interpret the will of God. Yeah, I think that has to do with, uh, say, Romans 12.1. Uh, in Romans 12.1, we're told to present ourselves as a sacrifice, holy and perfected or holy and acceptable to God. And uh, doing this will, will um, uh, it, it moves on into verse 2 and speaks about us being able to, you know, to know the will of God. So, as as spirit filled believers, we will more rightly discern God's word and understand and persevere through that. I think that's maybe the point they were trying to make. But yeah, I think it's weird and kind of funny. I'm weirded. I think it's worded kind of funny myself. But let me continue. But I don't know what his ability to interpret the will has to do with perseverance. It seems that perseverance has more to do with those who are sealed in Him by grace through faith who are elected and irresistibly or effectually drawn to him will remain in him. will will not abandon that faith because they are elect. But again, I, well, I mean, perseverance isn't so much. I mean, it's not once saved, always saved Layton. Uh, it, it, it kind of ends up in that if, if you will, but it has to do with like one who is, is a spirit filled believer will persevere. Not that they've just punched their ticket and they go sit on the couch, right? That, but they will persevere. Uh, they will. They will overcome. I'm accused of not understanding Calvinism, but I think I have a better working definition of Calvinism than at least what's presented here by Reformed Wiki, and uh, and I think that's worthy of noting. Unconditional election, very controversial in itself, even apart from what Alan is about to describe next. But then on the flip side, there is this doctrine called reprobation. And this is the idea that God chooses to pass over selecting certain people, thus leaving them in their sins, which means they will not be saved. Right. If God chooses to save some, then naturally that means God has chosen to not save everyone else. But the key is that God's not unfair in doing this because he is leaving them in their sins. Okay, so leaving, I'm backing up right there. They deserve the punishment, it says. Leaving he says they're leaving them in their sins. Okay, let's watch that. Actually, that means right. God has chosen to not save, not save everyone, else. everyone else. But the key is that God's not unfair in doing this because he is leaving them. Okay, so he's leaving them in their sins. Okay, Th this makes it sound like God did not decree for the fall, which we just read Calvin saying that he did decree that the fall would happen. It also makes it sound like God didn't decree the condition of all mankind because of that fall. In other words, was it just some happenstance or accident that all the posterity of Adam from that point forward became God haters from birth who would always say no to God and the gospel? Is that is the, is the result of total depravity as defined by Calvinist as being this inability to willingly to want to come to God? Is that an accident or is that something God divinely decreed? So just quote unquote, leaving them in their sins isn't really a good picture of what Calvinists actually mean. What it should be saying, he has decreed them to remain in their sins and to desire their sins from birth innately they can't no no oh i stopped your face let's see yeah okay maybe that's better your hands are funny but at least your face is a little bit better okay so god has decreed uh for them to be in their sins uh sure 
Okay. But let me let me put something else up here because he had mentioned uh our scholars before. Let me share this. So this is the Second London Baptist Confession. I'm at the, the founders. They have they have an um they have this in uh, modern English. So chapter three on God's decree. Let's take a look and see what it says here. So the section that um, Leighton would be talking about when it comes to God's decree would be here in, in chapter three, starting in section one. And section one is actually what he would be dealing with. The section one says this. It says, from all eternity, right? From all eternity, God decreed everything that occurs, right? Or whatsoever comes to pass in the original language. Nevertheless, God decreed uh, everything that occurs without reference to anything outside of himself. He did this by the perfectly wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably. Yet God did this in such a way that he is neither the author of sin nor has fellowship with any in their sin. This decree does not violate the will of the creature or take away the free working of or contingency of second causes. On the contrary, these are established by God's decree. In this decree, God's wisdom is displayed in directing all things, and his power and faithfulness are demonstrated in accomplishing his decree. Okay, there's something I want you to notice about this section of the Confession. There isn't a positive presentation for how this comes about. Right? You notice that? But there's nothing explaining how God's decree does anything. Uh, well, for one thing, the reason why that's not is because God's decree doesn't do anything. Right? It exerts no positive force on the creation whatsoever because God's decree is God's plan. Right? I've given the analogy of a house plan or a commercial building plan before, and it still stands. Uh, still stands. It's, the, the, the analogy stands. God's decree is his plan for all things. He has decreed everything that occurs. In other words, the, the almighty creator of the universe, who is omniscient and omnipotent, who is um, who, who needs no counsel whatsoever. Right? He doesn't. He doesn't look for other people to give him information that he can work off of. It only makes sense that if he's going to create a thing, right, that that every part of that thing would 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 be uh, laid out according to him in a plan. That's what the decree is. Right now, there is found within this section of the confession what we call apophatic language, uh, and and that just means negative language. Like although there isn't a positive case la laid out for exactly how the decree. Uh, is brought about, which we know how it's brought about, but 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 all of the intimate details in, in it, right? While we can't make a positive case for exactly how it is, we can say things about what it is not. And this is why it says, yet, uh, so right here, yet God did this in such a way. So talking about that he decreed everything that occurs, and God did this in such a, uh, such a way that he is neither the author of sin nor has fellowship with any in their sin, right? So you can't you can't get confused as though uh, God is the author of sin according to decreeing all things, right? Even though even though sin comes into being, sin comes into being through secondary causation, which comes about in the second part here. This decree does not violate the will of the creature. You get that, Leighton? This decree does not violate the will of the creature or take away the free working or contingency of second causes. Right? So this takes away, it, it, again, this is apophatic. Right? They're not telling us exactly how this is. There's, there, there, it's, there's like an inner debate of the Reformed uh, community as to exactly how this plays out. There's even some that posit something really close to your view of libertarian free will, uh, Leighton, but I, I'm not in that camp. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a different camp there, but, but, that's within the purview of here. Like the, the, the confession allows for 
uh, someone to kind of build a case for that. Right. And they do it off of certain metaphysics and and uh, and philosophical presuppositions. But nonetheless, the point is that however the decree uh, whatever the decree does, it does not violate the will of the creature, nor does it take away free working or contingency of secondary causes. In fact, it goes on to say, now here is something positive that it says. On the contrary, these, these, the these here is the free working or contingency of second causes are established by God's decree. Right? Romans eleven thirty six that all things are from him, through him and to him, right? God, all things belong to God. It, it is only because he has created that the secondary causes have freedom and contingency. Right. So, I mean, you make a lot of, a lot of accusations and claims of what Calvinism is and you, 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 you don't even, I mean, you, you kind of talk back to the decree a lot, right? God decreed all things. And you don't even, you don't even, Include within that that there there are uh, within within the confessions themselves within the Second London and also in the Westminster Confession of Faith uh, the all these clauses are in, are in the same basically chapter three of the London Confession is almost exactly the same as chapter three of the Westminster when it comes to God's decree uh, the wording I think maybe is like word for word exactly the same thing right so so both confessions the Westminster and the Second London uh, both uh, affirm that the decree of God does not violate the will of creature or take away uh, the will of the creature or take away uh, freedom or contingency of second causes, right? It establishes such. Now it kind of takes care of one side of this thing a little bit, right? I'm not going to make a huge case for like exactly how that works out. Uh, but I do want to say this about the back to the decree itself, because he, he's really harping hard on that, right? The decree causes X, the decree causes Y. No, the decree doesn't cause anything. A set of plans doesn't build a house, Right. Providence. Providence brings about the decree. And this is where secondary freedom and contingency comes into play. That's right. Free will choices and decisions of creatures actually bring about the decree of God. You get that, Layton? Freedom, free choices and contingencies, things that could be or could not be. Right, we're we're not positing for the most part. There's a there's a small group out there that might would posit uh, this this strict hard determinism where uh, things come about necessarily. But the framers of the confessions didn't posit that. They didn't believe in a hardcore necessitarianism. Right, they believed in they believed in freedom and contingency. Contingency contingency just means that which can or cannot be. Right. So within providence, these things are established. Right. The the um, the decree of, of God comes about what we call hypothetically uh, ne necessary. Right. It's a hypothetical uh, necessity that's involved with the decree itself. The decree, the plan doesn't do anything or exert any force on the creation. God's providence brings it about, which includes freedom and contingency within secondary causes. Right, so you can't just say that God has decreed everyone uh, to be sinful and to love and to stay into their sin as though they didn't have a choice in it, right? As though they didn't have any control over what they did, as though, as though God just sprinkled some dust over them and they became sinners. No, we, we know why they became sinners. Why did they become sinners, Leighton? Because Adam fell, right? This is the implication of the fall. Did God decree the fall? Yes, he did. Could God have decreed Adam not fall? Yes, he could have. Right, so, so Adam's falling was not necessary in the sense that God could have decreed Adam is not falling, right? But everything falls out according to the decree. Now, another part of the decree where, where you go wrong here is in the whole lapsarian issue, right? This is another inner debate on those who who actually posit God and a divine decree, where you stand in the order of the decrees. Right? Do you think that God, before anything else, he, he, he predestined the elect? Or, and this is just kind of the basic, there's a, there's a bunch of like d different things to go within the order, but just for our purposes, it, it, it depends on when God decreed the elect, like when, when the elect came into play. 
right? So you have supralapsarians and infra, infralapsarians on this, uh, in this discussion. So the supralapsarians would say that God decreed first for the elect. Then he created, and then he uh, decreed that Adam would fall, so forth and so on, right? Uh, decree, uh, yeah, decree the fall of man. Now, the infralapsarians would say that the decree of the elect comes post the decree to have Adam fall. So mankind was created, Adam was decreed to fall, and then God decreed his elect. Right, so you kind of get these, and this is a logical order. I'm not saying that there's this temporal sequence in which God decreed X, Y, and Z, but with all of the differing parts of the decree, we need to speak about them in at least a logical order. So the infralapsarians will say, which is what I am, which is what the majority of Calvinists are, right? The superlapsarians, for as much as you want to think they're the majority, they are the minority. Uh, the in infralapsarianism is definitely the majority uh, held position. But but they would they would say that the decree of election and therefore the decree of reprobation, which isn't really a positive decree at all. It, he, God chooses a people and the consequence of that choice of a people leaves other people out, just like uh, Alan said in that clip that you played. Right. But this decree or choice comes after God had decreed uh, humanity and Adam to fall. Right, so everyone, at the moment of this choice that God's make, God has made of his elect, everyone is worthy of condemnation. It's not as though he's choosing from a, a neutral group of humanity. No, they, they were all sinful, right? That none deserved to be saved. So God deciding to save any is a merciful grace. He wasn't obligated to do that. And we need to understand that when we speak about the decree, we need to, especially someone in your position, Leighton, you should just know better about this. You speak so simplistically about the decree that it causes X and it causes Y, not, not even knowing that you're talking about a plan causing something. I, like, like I've said a, a number of times over, I was in construction for a, num a number of years and I never saw a set of plans jump up and build the building. All, there, there were always other causes that brought that about. Just because God is the primary cause of all things, which you would agree with, you would agree he is the primary cause of all things, that, that he is the first cause, right? But just because he is the first cause of all things doesn't mean that he, he is the, uh, the, the direct cause of everyone's evil, sin, or wickedness. And all of that can be within his plan or his decree. The, all that's fine. Like I said, that, 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 that's not a problem because all of it comes about by secondary causation, just like the, the confession says, which comes about uh, freely and contingently, right? It's not necessary, which I know you don't like to hear because you want, you want to think that everything's, everything's necessary, but it's not. Uh, creation is contingent. It could, it could be or it could not be. Um, it's not necessary that I choose to eat cereal in the morning, which I usually don't. Like if I choose to eat cereal, that'd be an oddity. But it, it, it's not necessary, even though I might do it, and even though that might be God's decree for me to do that, still not necessary, right? There, there, there's a hypothetical necessity involved with it, a certainty from God's point of view with the decree. Uh, but in secondary causation, these things fall out freely and contingently. And, and if you can't get that, then you're never going to understand compatibilism, which, again, is the majority view of Calvinism, something that you don't want to um, engage with whatsoever, which is kind of weird. Right. Why would you just pick hard determinists to to engage with and then like throw a blanket over all of Calvinism as though all Calvinism is hard determinism? All right. We do posit freedom and contingency. Right. So it's it's not as though people don't have a choice or they don't have control over what they do. They absolutely do, Layton. Uh, I want you to understand this, but I also want you to be able to articulate it, at least in some fashion when it comes to this, because this kind of this kind of um, a simplistic putting forth of Calvinist understanding is is never helpful. All right, let's go back to Layton. Let's finish this thing up here. Let me get the confession out of the way. We'll stop sharing that. And let's get Layton back in here. There he is. All right. Now let's finish you up. You only have, we only have a couple minutes left. Sins 
isn't really a good picture of what can vacuum up a little that, bit is the, is the result of total depravity as defined by Calvinist as being this uh, inability to willingly to want to come to God. Is that an accident or is that something God divinely decreed? So just quote unquote, leaving them in their sins isn't really a good picture of what Cal an accident. Is, is that what you think? Do you think things fall out accidentally? Like, like God had no idea that X was going to happen some way. I, you know, I know you're not an open theist and I'm not going to say that you are right. You've, 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 you've said over and over that you affirm God's uh, exhaustive omniscience. Okay. Good deal. There can't be any accidents then. There just can't be, right? It, it, things cannot fall out accidentally from his perspective. Why, why do you think the book of Revelation reads as it does? Have you ever even, have you like done a study through Revelation? Have you ever noticed who it is that opens the seals, that, uh, you know, that, that, that controls the demons, that binds Satan, that looses Satan, that tells demons what they can do and what they can't? They're not just out there just just running amok as though God doesn't have a clue and everything's chaotic. No, no, nothing's chaotic about revelation, right? Nothing's chaotic at all. It's all laid out and, and uh, is accomplished according to the divine purpose of God. That's, that's in the book itself or, or in Job, right? Job or Isaiah 10 or second um, Kings 19. That's kind of one that doesn't get talked about a lot, but it speaks of God. Uh, God is the one who determined and brought about every single action that the Assyrian nation took when they were pillaging different countries. Right? Not, not just the Isaiah 10 uh, event that we have recorded for us where uh, God used Assyria as his rod of judgment against Israel. Right, You know that one really well, but the Second Kings 19 passage is speaking about not just that event, but all of the conquests of the Assyrians where it says specifically determined and brought about by God, right? Which would mean they were part of his plan, right? And providence is how they came to be, right? And then that comes through the, 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 the freedom and contingency of the Assyrians and the Assyrian king. It doesn't lay responsibility on God. Responsibility, responsibility of that lays solely at the feet of the Assyrians, I don't know why this is hard to get. Uh, well, I'll take that back. It is hard to get, but we don't we can't understand the mind of God, right? We can't we can't get into his thoughts. We can only go by what he has revealed, what he has given us. And what he has given us is that he is not um surprised by anything and the in the and that he doesn't learn anything. Again, take the book of Job. I mentioned that. Like everyone gets about on about the book of Job, right? That Satan said, well, Satan, Satan went down there and did X, Y, and Z to Job. And you'll notice if you if you read through the book of Job and uh, when Satan comes into the court of God, Satan doesn't mention Job. Who does? God does, right? God says, well, have you, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> right? And, and, and Satan the whole time is like, well, okay, yeah, he, 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 he worships you, sure. But you won't even let me touch him, right? As though... As though Satan is this this creature that can do whatever he wants. We we see in the book of Job that he is uh he's on a leash per se by God. But but God is the one who put forth Job. And and the amazing thing about Job is everything bad happened in his life, and you get to the end of it, and um, of course, this is much the same answer that Paul gave in Romans 9 when people question God's will. <laughs> Job finally asks God, he finally breaks down after being completely faithful and having a nagging wife and some terrible friends. He finally breaks down. And he says, God, why? Why does this happen to me, such a faithful man? And if you'll remember the answer he got, God didn't give, he never gives Job a direct answer as to why it happened. Of course, he does bless him at the end and give him everything back sevenfold. But he doesn't tell him why. In fact, the only answer that God gives Job when Job questions what had happened to him is he asks him, where were you when I pulled the strings for the foundation of the world? Right? Who, who is God saying he is there? And who, and who is God saying Job is? These things have to be taken into account. Again, this is why I asked you uh, in my last video, lay, us, lay out for us what you think about the doctrine of God. Who do you think God is? What, is it, what do you think it means for him to be omniscient? Do you think God is simple? Do you think God is made up of parts? 
right? Do you think God is any type of creature? Do you think his essence or his being is the same as ours? Do you think his choosing is univocal with ours, right? Do, do you, I mean, what do you think about these things? All of these come into play when I think about anything that God does in Scripture, in the New Testament or the Old Testament. There are boundaries there, and they're laid in place according to how God has revealed himself in Scripture. Right? These boundaries are put up, and they help me understand, at least in part, how it is that these things could be accomplished, right? Because I understand they can be they can be hard to put together. You can say, well, it says this, and then it says that. Like you have in Romans 9, you have, you have a stark sovereignty laid out in Romans 9. I know you disagree with that, right? But think of it from my perspective for a second, because in Romans 10, you have human responsibility laid clearly on the feet of the Israelites, right? But you have those two things that are um, laid out together, God's sovereignty in all things, including salvation in Romans 9, and then Romans 10, human responsibility. They go hand in hand. All right, let, let's finish this. Calvinist actually mean what it should be saying. He has decreed them to remain in their sins and to desire their sins from birth innately. They can't help it. They will always love their sin and hate the gospel because that's what God created them to be. And to no, it's because they're wicked, right? It's because of the fall of Adam. They inherited their their uh their nature, if you will, right? They 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 born, they're born into a fallen world with a fallen nature, a a nature that is touched totally by sin. Every every portion of us is what total inability means or to, total depravity means. Um, it, it's not that they 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 aren't that way because God decreed it to be such, right? Unless you're going to look at it just strictly from from the perspective that God is the creator of the universe and that He has a plan. I mean, I thought that was just basic Christianity. Right, people are responsible for their own sins. Layton, they 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 have no um, recourse to go to God and say, "Why have you made me this way?" <laughs> Again, I made a little short about that when you said that uh, something about that, but th they have no recourse to do that. That that has already been taken care of and uh, mentioned by Paul in Romans nine. Right, has the thing that is made have the right to? question the maker and say, why have you made me thus? In other words, it's a rhetorical question that uh, demands an answer of no, the thing made doesn't have that right. Neither do any, neither does, does any of the creatures that there is no excuse, Layton. you're providing one. And, and it seems you're providing one through, you know, you, you, um, uh, univocism. That word can be hard to say, right? Uh, univocism anyway, to do. By design. He's the one who did it. He's the one who decreed it. And so it makes it sound like God's being fair if you just leave that part of Calvinism out. If you just don't talk about the sovereign decree of God to con condition everyone to be haters from birth. Yeah, it sounds like he's just passively leaving them to do their own will and their own desire. But that's not true Calvinism. It's not according to the confessions. It's not what they're saying with regard to the divine sovereign decree. Not if um, Yeah, we read that a second ago, right? That the decree of God does not take away secondary freedom nor contingent contingency. Leighton is saying that the confessions lay out a view of necessitarianism, that all things decreed fall out necessarily. The confessions themselves say that God has decreed all things and they fall out freely and contingently. Now, who do you want to believe about what the confessions say? The, the, the confession itself or Leighton. Sorry, Leighton, I'm going with the confession. I just, I, I can't, I can't, uh, I, can't, I can't think of it any other way. I mean, what do you, what do you do with where the confession says that um, the decree of God falls out freely and contingently? Do you just think that they, they, they were crazy when they put that in there? Is that what you think? Do you think that they didn't think about that? Uh, the brilliant man that they men that they were. Now I'm not saying they were perfect; they could make mistakes, right? But they thought that stuff through before they wrote it down. It wasn't just it did, they didn't just throw that in there on a whim. And you make it like sound like, oh man, this is just the weirdest stuff ever. That they, then I'm 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 gonna not look at when they say freely and contingently, and I'm just gonna stick to the part where they say decree everything, and then use decree in my own uh, idiosyncratic way.
I, that, that's just not the way to engage. They hold to the T of TULIP. And that's why we keep pointing this out to Calvinists. Calvinists, you can't have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. You, you can't just ignore your doctrines of sovereign decree of all things being decreed by God. You can't ignore the actual claim of T and, and expect us just not to, to say something to you about it. I, who, who ignores it? I don't ignore it. And you can keep saying what you, uh, what you're saying there. It's not bothering me a bit. I mean, it bothers me that you don't articulate, uh, the position correctly, but yeah, I mean, your critiques have no, they have no, um, they have no purchase. Sorry that they're, they're just completely bankrupt. Again, I say this to in love. Now I want to say this, that doesn't mean that Calvinism is right. Again, I, 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 I bet I've said this and I hope people stick around long enough to hear this, right? Even if it's the case, and I believe it is, um, I really believe it is, that what Leighton is saying is bankrupt, like it has no purchase on Calvinism. That doesn't mean Calvinism is right. I mean, I, I don't I don't care about Calvinism. Do I think it's correct? Yes, I do. Do I think it's biblical? Yes, I do. Do I think someone ought to be in that camp if they want to be correct and biblical? Yes, I do. Is it necessary for their salvation or them to be a Christian or you know them to be faithful to, to Jesus Christ, a, a faithful follower? No, it is not necessary. All right? I do want you to hear that. I, I, I don't think that um, I don't think Calvinism is the big issue, but I do want I do want for Leighton to be able to engage in a in a way that is that could be fruitful or right? where there can be dialogue where each side's heard. Uh, I I don't find that to be the case if he keeps laying it out the way he does. To my brother, I hope that you see the error of your ways <laughs> in my in my rebuke of you on this regard. Because you're not just saying God is passively just letting people freely, libertarianly freely choose their sinful ways. Because that's not what any. He's got to snuggle in that, smuggle in that uh, libertarian free will there, right? But yeah, Alan's right. Alan Parr is right that he, God is, ha, he has passed people over, therefore leaving them in their sins, right? He has chosen not, not to to uh, to regenerate them so that they can come to Christ for forgiveness. Right? He hasn't made, it, God has never, the decree of God nor providence, I want to get this right, right? I want, I want to get this point right. I've said the decree exerts no force on the creation, and it doesn't. I said providence brings about the decree, and it does, right? But providence does, ne it does not include the force, manipulation, or coercion of anyone to sin, right? Get that? They, that nobody is tempted to sin. No one is coerced to sin. No one is forced to sin. There is no manipulation for someone to sin, right? All of this is done freely. That doesn't mean that God cannot um, harden a person in their sin, right? We see that with Pharaoh. Uh, Yet yeah, that can be done, but Pharaoh was already a condemned sinner. Right? Let's finish it out true Calvinist teaches or believes. A true Calvinist, at least according to the best scholars, believe that you're born in a condition by divine decree that you will always hate and reject the gospel. And you've got to say that in order for your audience to be able to judge whether what you're saying is actually a biblical concept or not. It makes it sound like God's being fair. All right, so that's it. That's the video. Let me uh, Let me get this out of here. Stop sharing the screen for a minute. Yeah, just to wrap this thing up, Leighton, <laughs> again, you can do better than this, man. Uh, let's have a talk about it. Uh, hit me up sometime. Hit me up through email. Hit me up on Twitter or Facebook. I mean, I know I'm not, I don't have a big footprint on any social media platform. Uh, tiny, tiny footprint, in fact. Right? And you may not think I'm worthy of uh, having a conversation, but you know, you and I have known each other for a long time. I mean, you know that. And I'm not someone who's who's coming as a uh, just an internet silly Calvinist here. I mean, I do have two churches that I've pastored for over four years, and I am uh, been in seminary a while, but I I, I I can see the end now. I'm really close to having a Master's of Divinity from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'm not just some hack here. Uh, yeah, give give me a holler, and we can talk some of this stuff out. I mean. I, I, I don't care that, again, I don't care that you're not a Calvinist. Doesn't bother me any. Um, 
there are some things that I think are very troubling with provisionism, something that I'll get into at a later date. Right now, I'm concerned uh, with some of the stuff he's putting out on total depravity. I think there are some some very concerning issues within provisionism uh, that I will get into. Some stuff that was it hadn't been that long ago. They had a um, had a pretty good talk with Layton and uh, Dr. Brian Abasciano, and that got a little that, that got a little weird. Uh, got a little strange, but I want I want to I want to talk about that at some point going forward. But um, let's talk about the whole total depravity thing, like wh- how it is that you formulate this. And please, please, let's talk about your doctrine of God, so I can at least understand where you're coming from. There, it's something other than just oh yeah, God knows all things, and God's all powerful. Yeah, sure, okay. There's some people who don't agree with at least the first one there that God knows all things, uh, but. Most agree that God's all powerful, but I want to know like where your position is on that with classical theism. If that's a thing, right? Is God simple or is God made up a bunch of parts? Uh, I know where Warren stands on it, but I know you and Warren, um, you're not the same person. So that, that, that doesn't mean much to me there. I want to know where you stand Layton. So, uh, put something out there, give me a holler and let's talk about it now for the rest of you. Thank you for sticking around. I appreciate you. Uh, checking out the content. If you appreciate the content, please give me a like, give me a subscribe, share the content. I'm tiny, 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 tiny right now. I need some more subscribers just so I have a few more people that are, that are sharing it around. The only way I'm going to get out there is if you share it around. I, I just want to bring some clarity to this, this topic. Not a lot of people interact a whole lot with Layton, like James White does, but he's such a, I like James White. Don't get me wrong. But he can be tough to interact with. I'm not James White in that respect. Um, I, I love James White. Don't get me wrong. Again, I don't want to. I don't want to put him down at all. He has been instrumental in in like uh, my growth. I've met him a few times, but but I'm not James White. I interact in a, in a bit of a different way. I am firm on some points, and I, I I I can be a little rough sometimes. But comes from me being a country boy from Mississippi, and I'm not some ivory tower intellect. Uh, but I can throw some punches in that arena as well. Uh, It's just not my cup of tea. I prefer more applicational stuff. Uh, I do like to get into philosophy and, you know, um, freedom and contingency and stuff like that with compatibilism. So we can go that route. But anyway, that's just who I am. Thank you for sticking around. I hope you like it. Share the content. And um, yeah, I'll catch you next time. See you later.